All right, has everyone got a beer? We're good. All right, so I'm Tim. I'm from uh, Twitter, and I'm also on the exec committee. And I've got the a huge blessing of I'm a really dumb guy who has a really smart team. So fortunately, I get to take credit for all the smart work they've done. Um, so Twitter, I guess, if you look a couple of years ago, came from a place where we had this backbone that was built based on Twitter being a tech service and based on 140 characters, an external service that was doing um, tw you know, Twimge, which was doing the images, and no real media content to speak of. And we started bringing some of the stuff on net, and initially it was with external CDN vendors. So we still didn't have the real burden of moving images and media content around. And about a year, about two and a half years ago, we started to bring all of that on there really aggressively. You know, built our own CDM platform, then started to release features like video, you know, which started as a 30 second video, and then full um, live streaming, you know, streaming services of sports, and other things like that. And we ended up getting to this point where we just scaled far beyond our network architecture. So, oh, and my key is to remember to do that. Um, so, Ultimately, we were in this position where we had one monolithic set of routers that were doing all of the functions we needed in our MPLS backbone. And we were in this position, we didn't really have you know, a great set of management of configurations of software. We had a relatively small global footprint, and at every point we were just running out of um, tools or capacity to manage this through. So we ended up having to sit down and really re-architect because we were getting traffic growth that looked like this. And this is from 2014, and that bottom point is a zero point. So we started to just ramp right up and got into a position where we just were having you know, daily or at least weekly outages that were really impacting the platform. So we did a few things. We firstly started to scale our load balancing layer in a really, really wide. This is a presentation I did at Middle Eastern Nog about some of the things we did to allow ourselves to start using more and more router ECMP than actual um, layer seven load balancers. We moved to a clause-based architecture in our data centers. And that's the idea that rather than having a couple of spine switches, you have these very wide spine and super spine layers where um, rather than building a core of your network, you're building these distributed fabrics um, that you can look at. And there's a link down the bottom, which will be when this is put up, available to a presentation Chris Woodfield did at Nanog about how we did that and migrated from OSPF to BGP. And you know, one of the challenges is our data centers had got to the point where we had over 50,000 LSAs in the area zero of our smallest data center. So you know, these scaling issues were really coming because we just had so much data we were needing to store. And then we completely redesigned our global network backbone and edge. So I'm kind of failing at the slide thing. Uh, where are we? There we go. All right, so I mean, the real challenge we had is we had, as I spoke about before, all of these features on all these routers. So when you've got, you know, obviously a relatively simple task like I'm going to terminate a data center onto my MPLS network, you don't actually need to have all the functionality available for terminating load balancers, for peering, for terminating CDN nodes. And you're in a position where you actually are causing yourselves more trouble and more bugs by doing that. So what we started to do is look at how we split those router roles out. We're also not making use of cheaper options like, you know, obviously there are cheaper options for a P router than a full-blown MPLS PE. We were in a position where you couldn't drain a device, where um, a single device had this huge blast radius because you would have all of one telco connecting directly into that device, or one router for Japan, right, you know, one of our biggest countries. So we started to really decide to invest in this. And the first thing we did is we implemented a P router we implemented a P router layer, which is a set of core routers that everything was hubbed around. And these P routers actually only ran three protocols. So the challenge is obviously the more lines of code you have than um, running on a router, the more bugs you're gonna have. So we started to really look at what do we actually need to pass labels, and that was it. Um, we had less than 400 lines in the configuration of these things, and we just really started to look at how we can make them as simple as possible while scaling them with them, and implemented the Juniper PTX series, right? And I'm going to tap on wood right now because we've never actually had a service impacting bug on any of these routers. And we have many, many of them. Um, that's not to say it won't happen at some point, but just because of how simple they are and how infrequently we change them, we're in a position where we've managed to keep this really stable core network. And then as we went through this, we also um, broke up our PE routers into different roles. So we have routers that terminate the 
data centers, routers that terminate the data center load balancing, or routers that terminate specifically our CDN fleet or our peering edge. And by doing this, we've managed to really simplify each layer to say, all right, if you're terminating the data centers, you only need to run BGP to the data centers and the base set of um, MPLS features to act as a PE. Whereas if you're terminating the load balancers, you probably need to be able to run some of the layer two protocols you need inherent in load balance to clusters. Hitting the whole fleet, a single bug would tend to hit one part of the fleet if it was a systematic vendor bug. Or if we were to screw up and say, let's say an operator halts a routing engine, which you know it happens, you're hitting one specific part of the service rather than taking the whole service down. So the more and more we split this up, we managed to make the network simpler and easier to maintain. But also it let us look at simpler hardware. So the reality is you don't need a full-blown MX for some of these simpler functions like terminating peering or you know, terminating a data center, et cetera. And you can start figuring out how you can save a lot of money, but also keep things again much, much simpler. And as we did this, we started to scale much wider. So rather than building these big, gigantic chassis and terminating everything on one box, which is a huge blast radius. We tried to actually um, build our edge routers as small as possible. So rather than having, say, a pair of routers, you might have 10 edge routers in a pop. And now if one edge router fails, you really stop caring because you've got so much capacity spread around the others, you're in a position where you can actually sit there and say, well, that router failed, we'll deal with it after the weekend. And we've got some automation that I'll talk about later that we've actually got to a point where routers automatically get knocked out of service if they have a chassis alarm or a line card failure. And we get into a position where, come in on Monday morning, five routers automatically drained. Awesome. You know, and you're now no longer worrying about these things happening. Now, obviously, there's some advantages we have around the fact that we are a content network, so there's no one customer connected to that router. Um, and you know, we're now in a position where no router is required for operational stability of the platform. And also the loss of a router will never cause us loss of redundancy. So you know, we can have multiple failures without having to care. So we have a certain threshold where we start caring if say, you know, there's a solar flare and five routers fail at once, we, we would start thinking about it. But beyond that, but before we get to that point, we're in a position where we don't actually have to think about this as much, which has taken a lot of work by the team to get there. Now, the other thing we had to think about was actually rib scale. So two years ago at Twitter, we had a full mesh of IBGP, which when it was 10 routers worked pretty fine. Once we start getting to 50 or so routers, all with multiple full tables, we're blowing out the rib in a pretty big way. So we were actually at a 95% utilization of the rib on all of our routers, and bringing in additional routers was causing some quite serious stability problem. But the bigger problem was that we'd actually reached a point where we didn't have the overhead and rib to even add route reflection. So we had to do some really interesting engineering to even add the route reflectors because we were at the point where adding a single router or a single full table reflected into the routers would cause them to run out of memory, which is obviously not happy times. And the bo for bonus points, at the time we also had a memory leak um, in the rib of our MXs. So we're continually having to power cycle these routers to, or kick RPD to actually address this. So we were in a bit of a precarious place just because we'd left it so long to bring in a route reflection layer. So what we actually did is we implemented, there we go, sorry. You have to listen to me talk rather than watching and ignoring. Um, so what we actually did is we implemented um, a hierarchical set of route reflection because when we looked at this problem we realized that if the rib scale of our routers learning all these routes was too great for one router, it would be too great for a route reflector with the same memory limitations. So we actually have a whole series of regional route reflectors that aggregate to hierarchical route reflectors so that any one router actually only sees a relatively small, and we're talking maybe 10 to 20 percent proportion of the routes and there's a significant amount of aggregation at every level to prevent you ever seeing that full view which would cause you to blow out your memory. And obviously while 64-bit code has helped, um, the speed at which we can converge routes, and we see about 250 million route paths on the internet, you know, instances of different routes, and we can actually converge that in, um, in about 15 minutes network-wide to the point that no, that the CPUs have settled on every box just because of how many points of aggregation we have. But the other challenge here was on, in an MPLS world, 
obviously you build LSPs from each router to each router and you end up in a position where um, you have to do all your ECMP decisions at the ingress router because when you go through intermediate routers, you're actually coming through as a light tunnel label rather than, actually, um, rather than making hop by hop IP decisions. And what this means is if you actually have four paths to a data center that you could see previously at the hop before that and spray it out, you can no longer do that. So we ran into these capacity issues where, because we were running one path really hot or and not using another path, we were actually unable to continue to scale at that level too, because we'd reached beyond the point where we could scale a single router or a single link. So there's a feature called add path in BGP, which allows you to reflect multiple copies of the same route. So rather than just re reflecting your best path, you reflect say the best four or six paths. And this allows us to ECMP out but also again blows your rib out again. So there's been this constant balance we've had to strike between um, hammering our rib and being able to actually scale traffic. We've arrived at, at four wide, which seems to be about right for us. Any more than that, and you know, every time you add another path, you add another full table from each route reflector. And then when you're a client of multiple route reflectors, you, know, you can easily get to about five or six million routes pretty quickly, which is still quite an intense number of routes to load into most routers. And there's probably three or four vendors that are capable of processing you know, six, seven million routes quite quickly, because then you add the externally learned routes as well. So, I mean, as I've talked about, starting from a full rib in that migration was actually incredibly challenging. And we ended up having to do a bunch of different things where we had to firstly actually do um, a Junos upgrade to get stable code that didn't have a memory leak. And um, then also start really filtering routes out. So we started doing things like saying, okay, if you have a local NTT feed, we're now no longer going to accept NTT routes for other routers. And there's a feature in BGP called Keep None, which has, in Junos, is, that's the flag for it. I believe there's a Cisco equivalent, where you actually say, if I'm not actively installing this route into my FIB, then I'm going to throw this route away. Now, the advantage is it really chops your rib down. The disadvantage is, if you lose the route you were using, you're now falling back to default. So you end up with a significant amount of traffic tromboning. But again, because of where we got to, we actually had to go down these paths. So the lesson learned there is, don't leave it as late as we did. <laughs> um, but also, I think there are some interesting methods to really cut that down if you have to. And obviously, not everyone's in the position where they can afford Rolls-Royce edge routers. So sometimes you do have to make do with a little less. So it's an interesting option if you need to. And then the other challenge we had was our transport traffic engineering. So two years ago, again, we had been in this position where an edge pop might terminate 5, 10 gig of traffic. And it is an, a rather large multiplier of that now, is all I'll say. But we're in these positions where you can't scale n by 10 or n by 100 gig links to fit everything onto one lag or one link. So we were in a position where we didn't have any traffic engineering or auto bandwidth. And we had to think quite hard about to do this because of some very specific Twitter challenges. And we also had these problems where we would you know, flap a link and we'd cause huge congestions for other parts of the network. So we were actually IGP based load balancing based on fiddling IGP metrics at the t um, all of the time. And obviously this is a non-scalable option. So um, we kind of had sat down as a part of this re-architecture and worked out what our high level goals were, which was obviously to use the lowest latency path because from our perspective, the faster we can deliver you your tweet, the more likely you are to stay engaged and to actually use our capacity really efficiently. The last thing we want is to have, you know, hundreds and hundreds of gigabits or terabits of capacity sitting idle, not used when we're having to rate limit back our storage replication traffic even if we're not using some capacity for something that, um, that is actually needing to be delivered right now, if we can utilize all our spare capacity that might be a failover path for important traffic for best effort replication, that's a huge win. But then also we wanted to minimize the scope of our IGP to just be to build MPLS tunnels and more importantly to use BGP for every decision possible because it's a whole lot more scalable. So. We implemented RSVP over MPLS for traffic engineering purposes. And we actually run an RSVP only network. And in that we don't use any BGP on our P routers. We don't have the knowledge, any knowledge of external routes on our P routers. There's no default. They're actually all in RFC 1918 space. So you can't actually even access a Twitter core router from the internet. And that's obviously providing a huge security win as well. 
in that you know, if the moment you expose it in some way to the internet, you've got the potential for someone to send a packet of death or you know, to put you in a position where you could compromise it. And then what we did is we minimized the scope of um, our IGP to the point that, um, it, and I've made a typo there, min minimized the scope of the IGP to the point it was just helping us establish RSVP tunnels and then re the IGP to reflect latency. So we actually use, reflect the RTT on our backbone links. So we're just using the fastest possible paths. And as a wee tangent, there's a metric that's used in advertising called the advertising quality metric. And essentially it is how well targeted is that ad. So if Joe wants to look at a, an ad about, um, if Joe's on Twitter, we want to show him lots of ads about beard products. And um, you know, ultimately, we can actually compute to an infinite level the best beard products to show Joe based on all we know about his brow dancing history. And <laughs> it's <is> dangerous. <laughs> Basically, we have a limited time window to do that. So when Joe opens Twitter, Joe doesn't want to wait a minute for his Twitter app to load, or when he scrolls through his timeline, he doesn't want it to be stuttering along. So we have X milliseconds to go and calculate that. And often that's calculated in a different a data center that's a wee way away from the pop Joe's connecting to. So assuming Joe's connecting to the Sydney pop, the last thing we want is for him to be taking a path that goes through Asia to the US, to the data center. We want him to be going as directly as possible. So by actually minimizing that latency, there's a really huge fiscal benefit to Twitter, which is, is kind of an interesting thing of actually we can compute you a better ad because we've spent less of that time interacting with the back end that's doing those computations on latency and more of that time where we can actually give it to the, comp the process and start understanding the best beard, beard wax product for Joe. <laughs> so, um, so we, we was, we, and that's kind of why we had to put a lot of effort into this and making sure we got this right. But also we implemented a really aggressive um, TE, um, TE implementation where we were actually doing a five minute overflow period, which is the minimum most vendors will allow. And that's because of this. This is a typical traffic spike that Twitter will experience during a world event. RSVP and internet protocols were not designed for traffic cliffs. RSVP and internet protocols were fundamentally designed on the assumption there is some form of gradual ramp up. And while we don't want to run all of our links at 10% utilization, because we're throwing a lot of money on the floor, we had to figure out how to deal with this and how to be in a position where we could actually absorb um, these huge amounts of traffic. And the reality is that I'll talk a bit later about the class of service we implemented to make sure that when we do congest, we're throwing away videos rather than throwing away the actual tweets. But also, we've just made our RSVP implementation as aggressive as, as possible to the point where we can now, within a period of a couple of minutes, move traffic around our backbone. But yeah, it's a fairly unique challenge. And this was, um, I think this was a protest in Paris, if I recall correctly. Um, but you know, we're literally talking you know, two times, three times the traffic volume within a period of about a minute or two. So if, just a very interesting and unique engineering challenge to a content network that you probably wouldn't see on other networks. So as we did our RSVP implementation, the first thing we realized is that link coloring just doesn't scale. And that it sounds like a good idea, but when you, you know, have in 100 PEs, or even in a smaller environment, in, time, you know, in PEs where it might be 10 or 15 in a small ISP, you have an any to any problem where you have so many LSPs that to manually say this LSP takes this path and this LSP takes this path is really hard. Now in New Zealand, because you have a very, where I come from running carriers, because you have a very long, thin country, you can kind of go left side, right side. With, anything more of, with any more of a complex topology, you just can't do that. So we actually made it an explicit decision to do everything in a way that we'd, we would be able to add any link anywhere and between any routers and utilize them efficiently and in a manner that suited our needs, which meant that anything manual was off the table. And also we discarded immediately PSEP, which is a controller-based solution where you have a controller making centralized decisions for your MPLS network and programming them into the routers. And the reason we discarded that was we sat there and went, controller is great, but that removes the distribution of the thinking in the network. So that'll work fine until there's a bug, or if we have a replica, a multi-chassis solution, it'll work fine until there's a bug that gets replicated between chassis. And didn't feel that was the most resilient way to build the network. 
So we actually started looking at using RSVP prioritization, where you can prioritize and say that certain LSPs get better access than other LSPs, or have the ability to kick off other LSPs. And we started obviously then using the lowest latency links for the most important LSPs. And we have class of service to actually map into these. And then we were in a position now where we have like direct paths between POPs or between data centers we were able to use very, very efficiently and indirect paths that we do a lot of Hadoop on, which is a storage replication protocol. And Twitter has one of the world's biggest Hadoop clusters spread across our global network. So that we have no problem utilizing all of our good links at about 80% the whole time. And then the other challenge you run into in an RSVP network is when you have an amount of traffic between two PEs that's actually greater than the, the biggest link between those two PEs. So if you're trying to establish a 500 gigabit LSP over a 100 gigabit link, you're probably going to be out of luck. Or if you're trying to establish two 70 gigabit LSPs over a 100 gig link, you're probably going to pack it in a really inefficient manner. So we actually extensively split the, the LSPs. So we'll have, say, 10 LSPs from PEA to PEB and actually spray or ECMP into that. So that way we now have, rather than a 70 gigabit LSP, 10 7 gigabit LSPs, which is relatively easy to bin pack efficiently into a 100 gig link. And as we did this, we realized we could actually solve this problem, surprisingly, because we didn't initially, as we were developing this, think we could do it without lags. And that we actually run every link at native speed and as a native link and push, have pushed all of the traffic engineering issues up to RSVP, which actually makes it easier because if anyone's you know, worked in operations and tried to debug that one link that is silently discarding packets on a lag, it's not happy times. Whereas if you're in a position where you're able to, um, when you're able to throw down some ICMPs down each link and analyze that, you can debug it relatively quickly. And actually as you get to those kind of levels of links where you're having hundreds or thousands of backbone links in your network, it actually really starts to matter to make those things easy to operate and then also to start to automate the operational debugging of these things. You know, if you have to shut down in each link in a lag to start to sit there and go, which link is a problem, you probably don't want to hand that over to an automated process. If you just have to run some ICMPs over the link, then you can say, this link is bad and turn it off. That's something that's very doable to automate. And then the last thing is, we used a technology called shared risk link groups, because we were in a position where we had lots and lots of links on the same cable systems. So if we have, say, 500 gig links on one WDM system between Atlanta and Dallas, and we're in a position where to an RSVP um, process, that looks like five unique paths which you can link protect over. But obviously, if they're all on the same fiber, the moment that fiber's cut, you've broken your primary path and your redundant paths, and you're taking an extended outage to traffic. So we, SRLGs allow you to program the network to understand that these are actually a shared point of failure and that you're now going to avoid them for your protection paths. Now back to the low versus high latency paths, a fast path on Twitter will sit at 80% all day and night. And then the worst paths actually you know, see spikes from time to time as we kick off replication batch jobs and the like. But we're actually in a position where we're utilizing these fast assets as, as heavily as possible. And if you look on our backbone weather maps, you'll actually see that 90% of the links run red constantly. Um, now that's, a lot of that is best effort traffic. We're actually trying to use it, you know, we view it that if we have a link we're paying for that we're not consuming entirely, then that's just wastage. So you'll see things like, for instance, a um, traffic bounced out through Asia or through Europe between two places because we wanted to saturate the network with storage replication and we had some free capacity. Uh, and we really have gone with this concept of for the traffic that is latency insensitive, push it any way we can and try and push this as fast as possible. And in a Hadoop world, you end up in a situation where the, your ability to pass traffic fast basically determines how in sync or out of sync you will be. So whether you are, for instance, 30 minutes behind in your backup nodes or you're two seconds behind. And even if you have an amount of packet loss, you can make that up fairly quickly and actually use that spare capacity when you don't have cable cuts to be very close behind um, on the slaves. Now, as we did this, though, we started pushing another scaling limitation, which was scaling the LSPs. So the routers we have have a 48,000 LSP limit, which is actually quite problematic. Um, and that this is a weird problem for someone who has spent most of his life running New Zealand scale ISPs. 
Um, but what we, we ran into two issues basically. The P, the P router scaling limits, because they've got very limited fibs, which you pay a lot less for. And also the CPU scale on all of the routers, because every time you establish a, an LSP, you're in a position where you now have to send refresh messages. You have to maintain that LSP on every router it crosses. And on the ingress router, you have to monitor your auto bandwidth and check that if it changed, you have to actually re-signal the LSP. So there's no ability in RSVP to actually send an update of bandwidth. If you want to change your reservation from 20 meg to 20.1 meg, you establish a new LSP, flip the traffic, then tear down the old one. So you in, end up in a position where you're changing so much state and maintaining so much state that this was actually really starting to be a problem for us too. And we didn't actually catch this in our initial engineering of the network because it's fairly hard to lab at that scale and actually start seeing these things without the sort of traffic we see. And then the problem you run into as well is that the fail over time start being a real issue. So when you have 20,000 LSPs on a 100 gig bearer, then when you, actually tear, when you actually have a bounce on that link, to go and send the tear messages back to the ingress LSRs of, for tw times 20,000, that's going to take a wee while. So we did a few things, and there, um, there, there were two key things we were trying to address. And the first one was the cost of maintaining an LSP. So RSVP message aggregation allows you to aggregate the, um, the refresh messages and all of the standard maintenance tasks you run into bundled messages. So you're sending less interrupts to the CPU. You're still processing the same amount, but in a more efficient bundled manner. And then we actually sat down and, and realized that 99% of our LSPs were under 20 meg because 99% of our LSPs were catering for situations that might not exist because we were making decisions in, in aggregate. And we were saying, Peering routers probably want X LSPs from peering router to peering router in case traffic trombones. Data center routers probably generally want X amount where that might make sense when you're going to Tokyo but a little less sense when you're going to Dubai or Sydney. So um, we started putting some rules in place where we don't reserve for less than 25 meg. We don't make adjustments for anything that is less than a 3% change in bandwidth consumption. Um, and then we don't actually update flooding either on the, in the TED um, for bandwidth changes on links themselves for less than 3%. And we actually cut down the number of changes, of state changes in our in RSVP network to 1% of what it used to be. So, you know, and that is just dealing with these very small changes or very small LSPs. And that really started to solve the, um, the change problem, but we still had too many LSPs and we're having to actively steer LSPs away from certain P routers to prevent them from getting overloaded and blowing out the fibs, which is a real, in really interesting challenge when you come from this side of the world. Um, so we st implemented, a, uh, we're in the middle of, sorry, implementing a standard called T++, or the, the internet draft is container-based LSPs. And essentially what it says is where previously you said, from my data center to every peering router, I want 16 LSPs, because that sounds about right in the back of your head, and allows you to split into small enough chunks. We, um, T++ lets you say, from PEA to PEB, spin me up one LSP per X gigabit, then when the LSPs go down to Y gigabit, tear, the, tear a few down again. And then we go from a position of having this arbitrary number of LSPs to having a very, very well engineered um, set of LSPs that exactly match the current traffic pattern. And for us, the peak in Japan only lasts a few hours. So now you're spinning up you know, a huge number of LSPs to Tokyo when Tokyo is really busy, tearing them down, then spinning them up. Significant reduction in the number of LSPs that we're spinning to the point we could actually run the number of LSPs on any one PE and aren't having to deal with those problems of scaling um, LSPs through the FIBs, etc. And then the final thing we ran into, which was really interesting and surprising, was that when you have an RSVP P router with no internet table and no default, and you have an, an LSP flap, and generally in a prioritized network, you're gonna map all of the high priority LSPs from PEA to PEB on the same path, assuming it's less than 100 gig, remembering we don't lag. Then suddenly you're in this position where while you do the reroute, you have no ability to forward that traffic because you can't IP route it. If the LSPs from PEA to PEB turn down, you put it onto the IP next top, the P bucket. So we looked at a bunch of options and um, we, you know, we looked at, you know, do we put LDP in place? 
you know, which was the obvious one, do we start trying to put a partial table with some defaults onto our PE routers, which we didn't want to do because we didn't want internet, any internet access from them. But then um, Nick Slabarkov from Juniper actually came up with this really unique and interesting idea where we built a, a full mesh of single LSPs from every router to every router, turned off CSPF or any intelligence around the availability of paths, and just used the best IGB path, and then de-preferenced it or de-weighted it in the routing table so it would always be secondary as a routing protocol preference to the others. So when we actually lost um, our, SVP, our RSVP in the preference seven on Juniper, we would fall back to preference eight, noting LVP is actually preference nine. So essentially we built LVP out of a single set of RS, dumb RSVP tunnels. And what we really gained from that is we didn't implement another protocol on our P routers. So now we're not activating X lines of code, which are X lines of bugs. Um, which actually has worked out really, really well in that we've generally seen these take significantly diverse paths from our production LSPs in most cases. So the next thing we had to address was our class of service. And the challenge we have is obviously we have a whole range of importances of traffic. So we have you know, Kelly's tweets and also we have um, you know, the Hadoop team's replication of Joe's long videos. You know, so you end up in this position where you probably want to deliver Kelly's tweets, which contain advertisements, before you're going to deliver you know, Joe's long recordings to a date to another Hadoop node to store it long term, which I'm not sure why we would do. But um, <laughs> <laughs> we do it. We, we do you a service, mate. Um, but anyway, so we, um, we previously were in this position where for storage replication, we would actually police it down to the, minim the minimum amount of bandwidth we calculated we would ever have available. So we were only maybe a third to a half utilizing our network at absolute peak because we weren't in a position to deal with congestion. And this is an obvious implement class of service and be done with it problem. Um, so we really wanted to be in a position where we could actually start utilizing our network fully all of the time, as I was talking about before. So um, we did this. And um, one of the things we were in a position to do is because we control every line of code on every server, we were in a position to actually trust all of our customers. Except for our Internet Edge, we were able to trust markings off servers, which is a unique thing to be able to do. So we actually implemented most of the intelligence for class of service in Finangle in our, in, in our application platform and started actually looking at what part of code generated this, um, this traffic. So we can literally sit there, regardless of port, regardless of IP ACL, and say, actually, TFE API, Twitter front end API generated this, so we need to give this immediate priority. And this packet is the far end of video chunks. So obviously you might give priority for the first five seconds of chunks for video, but then deprioritize the last minute of a video so because you know that you've actually got a bit of time to get that out to the customer. Then if we're in a position where the customer's not getting that, start to prioritize those up. So you can make a lot of really interesting decisions, some of which we've coded and some of which we're far from coding at this point, where you can actually really efficiently use your network for the right traffic because we also control the phones. So we can also start not using DSCP markings, but we can start at the application layer marking from the phones what they need urgently and what they don't, then reflecting that at the service layer out. So we've refle also reflected our class of service decisions into our LSPs. So we don't want to push storage replication into the same LSPs as Fraser's tweets. We want to be in a position where we're going to um, put those onto, you know, Fraser's tweets onto a really fast path and the storage replication onto a slow path. So we've fed that into um, our LSP routing decision making and we're now in this position where with all of this we're able to run our links really hot and respond to um, scale issues or bursts really quickly. And there's still issues in that the reality is on any network if you start quadrupling your traffic or in the case of some of our New Year's situations going far beyond that, um, you know, New Year's is actually one of the biggest usage um, times for both Twitter and Facebook just because everyone's sitting there tweeting Happy New Year's. Um, and you know, in some of those situations, we are going to have an amount of packet loss for a small amount of time, but ultimately recovering those thing, from those things in two to five minutes rather than recovering with a manual change is always going to be significantly better. And as we did this, we ran into this the thing where we realized that n by 10 gig has some very real limits. The reality is you can only ECMP so wide, you can only have so many LSPs. So as much as we did a bunch of technology work to try and enable us to scale our LSPs as far as possible, we ran into a, we started to realize this just wasn't tenable. 
But also 100 gig price compression has got pretty aggressive in the US. Generally, a small number of 10 gigs equates to the cost of 100 gig. And we were able to use this as a cost optimization thing too. So we've st we've, we're actually in a position where Twitter, Europe, Asia, and North America is 100 gig only. We do have some 10 gig to um, more remote regions. We've actually started to consolidate that too. We kind of project that around 2019 or 2020, based on current growth patterns, we'll start running into the same issues with 100 gig, but 400 gig is looking like it will land end of 2018, start of 2019 in a format that's usable. And one of the challenges is 400 gig is that there's a million and one standard. So there is 16 by 25, noting that 100 gig is now four by 25, there's eight by 50 and four by 100. And everyone's, everyone in the content space and in the tier one space is holding out for four by 100 waves, but we don't actually have 100 gig wave technology right now. We have 25 gig wave that we're doing a spray on. So what we're really looking for is to try and scale until we can develop that, which everyone expects to happen towards the end of this year, start of next year, and then to be productionized a year to a year and a half later. And then what we've actually started to do as well is in the metros deploy our own DWDM systems, because ultimately if you're paying a carrier for 30, 40, 50, 100 gig links within a, around a city, that you start getting to a position where that stops making sense to do yourself. So we've actually started getting into that layer too and um, deploying our own transport systems to enable us both to save on costs, but more importantly, there's nothing worse than being in a position where you're expecting to deliver X amount of traffic on New Year's and your, your carrier is five months delayed on their line cards and might get it to you five days before New Year's. And you're gonna have to scramble to put all this capacity in. So from that perspective, it's really helped us in terms of actually delivering things on time and having control of, out of, over our own capacity. Yeah, um, and then the other thing we've done for long haul, and of the scaling point you have to actually hit to make it worth buying a pair of fiber around Europe or the United States is quite far beyond where we are. There's only one or two social media companies, in fact, two social media companies that have gone and built their own WDM systems. Um, but what that actually allows us to do is interesting in that if you've got your own WDM network, you're buying the one fibre from A to B and maybe a diverse fibre. If you're buying waves, you're in a position to spray it over a lot of parts. So for example, every 100 gig over the Pacific and over the Atlantic has its own unique cable system. And you know, there's 20 or 30 cable systems across the Atlantic and a similar amount across the Pacific. So this is pretty doable. And say between DC and Atlanta or DC and New York, we're in a position where we're on eight or t um, cable system or cable parts on one and ten on another. So you get into this position where a cable cut stops being this, we've lost half of our capacity, and starts being this, we've lost a small percentage. And a lot of what we've been trying to do in terms of scaling our network is to get the blast radius down from we've lost half of our capacity to X to we've lost such an insignificant amount that we basically expect that amount to always be gone because things are constantly failing. And now we're in a position to stop caring as much. And turns out that we're all pretty lazy um, in terms of network operators. And being able to be lazy, not getting phone calls at midnight, not having to deal with things overnight is really awesome. You know? And also helps for a reliable network. So hopefully I haven't bored you too much yet. But I mean, Joe's beard's looking OK, so I think we're good. It props you up, props you up mate. Good, good. Uh, <laughs> So, while I go on status runs to earn points, it's probably not as advantageous for packets to go on status runs. And one of the challenges we had is we were originally doing DNS-based um, traffic mapping. So we would say, if we believe, based on our DNS providers, that you are in Sydney or Sao Paulo, that you, we should map you there. Unfortunately, DNS-based mapping has a tendency to land the user in Sao Paulo in Sydney, or vice versa. So we started running into all of these situations where what we had wasn't working for us. And while it's a relatively minor percentage, you know, you're talking 0.1 of a percent of your users, that is still 0.1 of a percent of your users in the places where Twitter is needed most. And for us, you know, our big thing is trying to be the people that you can tweet to when you're in Iran under persecution, you know, or in those sort of challenges, right? And that's the 1% that will generally be traffic mapped really, really badly. So, we have, in the interim, and this is the current state, moved to an anycast model, where we have a single monolithic unicast stripe that is worldwide, and we are relying on BGP routing.
which will bring it to the closest BGP point, but still require a significant amount of traffic engineering with our ISP, with our transit providers and our peering, etc., to prevent, say, NTT from announcing our routes to Tata and ensure that we're going direct to Tata in Southeast Asia rather than through Japan is a good example of one of the biggest challenges with engineering around Asia. And, but this has significantly improved our performance. But our long game is we control these and we have 95% of our traffic on one of these on code we write. We, have, you know, we are a mobile first application and we control all the code on the back end. So we can actually start to look at things and we're in a pathway at the moment we're starting to look at what would happen if I turned up 10 TCP sessions from this to different VIPs that are announced, virtual IPs that are announced on networks that are announced in different places. So if I'm in Australia, what if I had a TCP session through a transit provider in Australia, through all the, the and one that was on a prefix announced to all the peering points, one and one that was announced out of the US, and one out of Singapore? Because if you're here, you may actually get better performance from Singapore than Sydney. And then we start actually measuring, <laughs> yeah. For, yeah, for like, for like the one month a year that, uh, <laughs> yeah, mate, yeah. We were in, um, we were in a conference, a peering forum conference in Asia, and AAG was down, and they left notes under our doors because they realised we were all internet people, suggesting we fix it because their internet was slow. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, I wasn't particularly interested in going for a swim to find the cable break. Um, but anyway, so our long game is we're working towards and we're building testing mechanisms to get us towards actually building a traffic mapping service where we can start see, you know, getting our clients to send ingress traffic to the right places. And the, the, only ben the benefits aren't just limited to performance. We're also in a position where generally you're going to maintain enough capacity on an internet exchange that if your A port fails, your B port can handle all, or lag can handle all of the traffic. What if your A port fails? All your clients detect it's a bit congested and back all the traffic off. And now you're running at maybe 98% because you've backed enough traffic off. And there's kind of those things where you have an infinite set of possibilities around what you can do there. So luckily at Twitter, we have this fleet of about 3,000 software engineers who you can kind of use to work on some of these interesting problems. And we've got a really good cross-functional kind of working ethic where I've actually got a, we've got a team of people who are working on starting to develop some of these sort of things that you have an opportunity to do when you control the code on people's phones. So in a year or so, I'm actually expecting to be able to come back and do a talk with, um, at a few conferences about how we've solved this, which we're far from now. But we're in kind of this interesting position where because we have a content network, we're in one of a small number of companies that might be able to solve this. And there's actually only two I know that have really solved this problem. So moving along from that, and please, I'm going to do questions at the end, so please feel free to yell at me if you think that's particularly stupid, which most things I think of are. Um, we have, the other thing we actually started to think about was router draining. So typically, if you have a router and you have a bug, you have a bunch of packet loss, and then you try and fix it. You reboot a line card, and over that time, you end up burning, say, 5, 10 minutes, an hour maybe, if it's a particularly hard one, and you're impacting your users. So being in a position where we don't have directly attached customers, so you're not going to cut Joe's house off if you drain a router, which might be a good reason to drain a router, um, then we're in a position where we can actually start to think about, oh, look, mate, you're just very easy to pick on, you know? I'm not going to offend anyone by picking on you. <laughs> anyway, um, so we actually started to move to a model where we expected a certain percentage of our routers to be out of service at all times. And this is great because, you know, again, back to the weekend scenario, we can just drain the router. We can have a script drain the router. We can, you know, start doing things that don't require us to think too hard when things are broken because I personally find I'm not incredible at thinking at 2am. And we, so we started to do this work I mentioned before, we lowered the blast radius of each device. You know, line cards are very are, are expensive and chassis are cheap. So we were in a position where by spreading the line cards over the number of chassis, we actually spend less on the, on the line cards because you're assuming lesser fail at any one time. But then what we did is we built in a, um, what's called a Juno supply group, which is essentially a template on all of the routers where we start where it was called drain and this template did two things it stopped exporting bgp routes and it overloaded isis so now rather than going through a complicated run booked kind of process to take a router out of service you could just to toggle an apply group and the router was out of service and then you can do anything to it 
So also, if you're changing your power supply, if you're changing a fabric, a line card, we can err on the safe side and just take it out of service before we even start touching it. And then it means that we're not having to schedule these maintenance windows. Engineers aren't getting up at 2 a.m. and our customers aren't affected because we were too lazy to get up at 2 a.m. So everyone wins. But then we also started to think about this in a sense of what happens if a whole data center fails? Because about once every two years, we're gonna be in a position where a data center will fail in the US. In Brazil, it's probably once every three months. Um, so we started thinking about actually being ready for those situations to happen. So rather than this being an emergency, rather than you know, someone breathing down the neck of a colo provider, we actually wanted to be in a position where we could drain pops. But also this allows us to get into a position where has anyone here done a cage move before? <laughs> yeah, so if you're having to you know, move cages, the last thing you want to be doing is five back-to-back -back nights at, um, you know, from 2 a.m. to 5 a.m. when you move X amount at a time. And we actually now are in a position where if we want to migrate a cage of, say, 10 routers, we'll just turn the pop off. And then we'll spend a week doing it really nicely. Then we'll do a bunch of testing and turn the pop back on. And we've really started to build out this network to a point where we don't have to to start worrying about these things at a router or a pop or a building level and we worry about things at an aggregate capacity level and move traffic around. We actually regularly run tests where we turn pops off and confirm that we still have that capacity. So you know, obviously we can control the transport side really easily, we can control our traffic engineering really easily, we can't control where requests come. So we do tests like turning off all of our UK facilities and seeing which, I, which IXs in um, Europe, things land, we, our traffic lands in. And you know, we can actually, from that, we, we'll do these off-peak and at peak, and we'll deduce where we need more capacity. And by doing these regularly, we're in a position to capacity plan for those failure scenarios. You actually have to test to figure out. And then the other interesting thing in our scale is that we actually don't really need to lab too many changes. And that might sound really dumb and counterintuitive, but we're in a position where if you can drain routers at a time, there's nothing to stop us from draining a few routers, applying a change, seeing if it's stable and undraining them. And then, because of the number of routers we have, there's nothing to stop us then slow rolling that across the fleet, where we exponentially increase the number of routers a change is pushed to, to start being able to make sure that we can roll back or drain out the routers that are, have been affected up to a certain point. And it actually makes for a much more efficient deployment pipeline where you don't have to go through the sometimes futile effort of trying to think of every scenario a network might experience, which you'll never get all of them. And you can actually just start doing this in real time, but doing it in a safe, controlled manner where you can back out really, really easily. So we've started to do that um, for almost all of our changes, and that's allowed us also to start automating these deployments. So I sit in meetings quite, um, quite a lot during the day, and I often say this quote, never send a human to do a machine's job which our friend Neo gave us. And I think the real thing is that you would actually, I'm really useless at looking at two sets of data and doing a quick comparison on, on the screen. But there's a really cool tool called Diff, which is really, really good at that. And, pardon? D-I-F-F, -F. it's like T-U-M, right, for Tom. <laughs> Anyway, um, so what we've started to do is actually remove humans from our processes. So for instance, when we do a Junos upgrade, two of our team who work in Dublin um, have got it to the point now, we're using Ansible, where, and, and a few tools that have been published, where we don't actually have humans verify anything. So the process of doing a Junos upgrade at Twitter is you run a one-line command. And that you'll get a bunch of status and a bunch of output, and the outcome of your Junos upgrade will either be this has failed and the router has been left drained. So it'll drain it, run, do some, th run some pre-checks, do the upgrade, run some post-checks, and it'll either say, your upgrade has failed because of X. The router is out of service. Um, and then you have time to go and look at it and amend that and decide if you want to undrain the router or not. Because sometimes a change might be external to you. For instance, we say the routing table must not have changed in size by more than 3%. But sometimes, if, say, a major carrier in the US has fallen off the internet in that time, that's probably an invalid um, th um, assumption to make. But, also, but if it works, it's literally the upgrade is done and the router is back in service. And because we have such an interesting set of data as far as our users, we can also start monitoring things like success rate in the region that that router was. So we can say, please, you know, we can actually reach out and check. We, undrained or, we drained this router, or undrained this router, 
And did the Twitter overall service success rate change? Did the clients report that they were getting more 404s from, um, from the Twitter API? Did they report all these different things that we can start monitoring in and saying, well, actually at the time we undrained the router in the five minutes afterwards, the service went, went to a really, really bad place. We should probably take that back out of service or put it back in service if we took it out, revert the action. And actually, the reality is we've realized that hu humans are really bad at this job compared to machines. So but the more we've pushed to machines, the more operational reliability we've achieved. So you can all ignore me pretty soon. Um, um, we've really focused on standardization. So automating you know, our config templates, building very strict standards for physical infrastructure, roles for routers, and starting to actually define the configurations and databases offline to the routers and push things out. And obviously that's been a real process because no one has a perfect network, no one greenfields a perfect network. But what we've really started to do is taking it from trying to standardize what we have and audit, do an audit based approach to starting to actually push configurations out and build whole data centers from databases and start to build you know, whole backbones from databases. And that's been a very gradual process and is still ongoing. But we're now in a position where a significant proportion of our configurations are not built by humans. And you might go and update that configuration but manually, but if you do that, you, your update won't last long. So you can still sit there and go, right, well, I want to test if this link has X problem and I'll make a change to it. And that's great, but within an hour, that config won't exist anymore. So you always revert back to the database, to database driven states. And we're by no means there, but it's, it's something we're very much working towards and have got to in some places, which means you just get this advantage of consistency where you actually have a very known state as to what your network should look like. And nothing is more important for this than the physical infrastructure. I'm sure everyone's been into a terrible point of presence or data center where everything's um, cable badly, where you've got, you're running over your power levels, et cetera. And I think we went from a place at Twitter where we had a bunch of people like those in this room who are really good network people and maybe don't have expertise in power management or facilities management to actually um, bringing in a bunch of experts who now run all of our data centers and our pops and start and manage this in a way that you know, we have power calculations before every device goes in. You know, we have regular auditing and they actually get, do, get everything to the point that it's energized, it's cabled, the structured cabling, and then we just do the configuration work. And what I've come to learn at Twitter particularly is the level of expertise that's required to do POPs really well. And it's a really, really complicated job to do at scale. So we've started to actually have re a really reliable service by not having routers bouncing because we lost the A feed and we were over the AB combined feed uh, limits, et cetera. And I think the thing I, we've always underestimated is how much impact that would have to our service. So questions? Sorry, that was a bit, of, a bit of stuff to consume, but hopefully it was interesting. Thank you very much, Tim. Um, I've got a couple of... <laughs> no worries. Tom. I, uh, <laughs> thank you very much, Tom. <laughs> I've got a couple of questions. Um, yeah, ma'am. You talk about the bin packing of LSPs. Yeah. Do you do magic above and beyond Juniper's uh, order, cause, or order bandwidth to rather than just reduce the size of the LSPs? Or? So we reduce the size of the LSPs, spin up LSPs on demand for size, and we use RSVP prioritization to prioritize what's there. We do prioritize smaller um, LSPs from certain router roles to certain router roles over others. So for instance, an origin data center to a pop is prioritized over a data center to data center because there's statistically likely to be more links. But no, we don't do anything you can't implement on both a Juniper or a Cisco. So we have a rule that you have to be able to implement any feature on two vendors. Nice. Yeah. And the second question relates to the what was it? Oh, the change verification. Yeah. So given you're probably going to be doing your changes in the same sort of time period that other app um, yep. owners might be doing, if you were checking a service's, uh, I don't know, rate of 404s, how can you be sure that your change, I'm assuming it, it's not atomic? So... How do you check that there isn't a DBA team doing a change? Really good question. Twitter has a thing called the Twitter Command Center, which are a knock that is not a knock, as they like to remind us. And there are a bunch of um, sy systems engineers who build tools to automatically monitor the origin of issues. They coordinate all changes, and then we actually have a logging pipeline that just records changes made either by puppet deploys or network changes. So there's that and that we can do some correlation, but we do still have changes going at the same time because we're too big to do, in, to do one at a time. But generally, we have an advantage that if we break something, we're probably gonna break it for all services. 
because the network it, ha it doesn't discriminate between services. Whereas if a DBA team breaks something, they're probably going to break a very specific set of things to a, to relating to that database. Except if, except if it's relating to, say, a quas tag level. Yeah, no, very, very much so. So that is a problem we have not entirely solved. And that's the, the honest answer is that those sort of problems happen infrequently, but when they do happen, that's the point we do start involving senior engineers, et cetera, to start really looking into it. And there have been a number of situations where we have start, had to start really unpacking and reverting things. And while there's nothing worse than reverting the last five changes, it's sometimes in every network of every scale what it comes to. Nice, thank you. When you, when you were talking about optimizing latency and, and stuff yep. across parts, how are you actually calculating that, as, given that your P routers, for example, don't know? Bunch of contractors who do link turnups, right? So what they do is they ICMP um, over a link 10 million times with um, 9,000 byte packets. And then they ICMP over to put traffic on it and test that there's no issues. Then they ICMP 100 times with, uh, with 64 byte packets. And the lowest RTT that we see over those 100 packets will reflect the link latency rather than the CPU of the routing engines. And we take that value and round down to the nearest whole number. Um, so we just test every time as we bring links in. Um, because obviously you can't ping, ping beyond the immediate link often. But if we actually understand what each link is able to do and assume that particularly the P routers we have, uh, um, the most, so I can speak to Ju what Juniper do because I know the architecture intimately. They only have one buffer in the entire packet walkthrough from port to, from ed, port, to port on the PTX. So the buffers are cut down, the, the interactions that would introduce delay are cut down far enough that there is a near zero impact to passing through a router. So we kind of exclude them from our evaluations. And what about paths that you're getting from another carrier? How can you detect if that path's changed on you? Um, so we go through once every month and monitor that. And we, we do do regular audits of that. And so we, at, when you're buying WDM links in, in, in America and most of the Northern Hemisphere, um, you will buy them based on an agreed and contracted KMZ. So there is a contract, contractual solution to that, but also it's something we do have to verify regularly. <laughs> Which beard? <laughs> cool. Well, hey, thank you for letting me take up some of your time, and um, great to all meet you. Um, thanks, Tim. And for the record, your ideas at 2 a.m. are usually pretty good, so. Well, there are a few engineers at Twitter with Juniper. No, they're just scared. It's all right. Um, I also want to. I also want to say thanks to both Kelly and Will for organising tonight and doing all the media and everything. Um, these functions don't happen without you guys, so thanks very much. Greatly appreciate it. And of course, thank you everyone for coming. Enjoy some more drinks and some food. Thanks.